Walt Disney's Disneyland. When you wish upon a star, makes no difference who you are. Each week as you enter this timeless land, one of these many worlds will open to you. Frontierland. Tall tales and true from the legendary past. Tomorrowland. Promise of things to come. Adventureland. The wonder world of nature's own realm. Fantasyland. The happiest kingdom of them all. And this week from Fantasyland presenting A Story of Dogs. Now, here is your host, Walt Disney. Our first dog star was Pluto. A lot of you probably remember Pluto, and you'll be renewing your acquaintance with him later on in the program. But right now, I want you to meet the stars of our latest dog picture. Lady and the Tramp. Now, Lady and the Tramp has really been a fun picture to make. I remember another picture as being fun to make. That was Dumbo. Now, Lady and the Tramp has that same quality. It was an original story to start with, and as we made the picture and got to know the characters, we kept getting new ideas, and we had the full leeway to expand them because there wasn't any set storyline. Now, that's what I mean by this being a fun picture. Now, we've had a lot of requests from people who want to know how we put our pictures together. So for this part of the program, I want to give you an idea of how we went about making Lady and the Tramp. Well, first, we must find our stars. And being a dog picture, we naturally looked at a lot of dogs. And they were a mighty appealing bunch. Almost any of them had what it takes to be a star. But we finally decided that this little charmer was the perfect choice for Lady and that this fellow was far and away our best bet to play the tramp. Now we have to get a story for them. Now at our studio, we don't write our stories. We draw them. Now this particular story unit is made up of Joe Rinaldi, Joe's an idea and sketch man, and Ed Penner, writer and director of the story unit. In making a full-length cartoon feature in CinemaScope, it takes perhaps 50 of these storyboards and thousands of sketches. Uh, here we have a condensed version of the story that we've put together especially for this show. Lady and the Tramp is a sort of a dog's eye view of life. Dog meets dog, dog loses dog, and of course dog gets dog. As the title indicates, our principles come from widely separated walks of life. Lady, who lives in a better section of town, is a refined young cocker spaniel who takes her household duties quite seriously for she's been coached in all the niceties of canine etiquette by her two neighbors, Jock, an elderly Scotty who's rather inclined to judge other dogs by the length of their pedigrees, and an aging bloodhound named Trusty, who unfortunately is losing his sense of smell. Across the tracks, far from the kennel club set, lives the tramp. He's an all-American dog, a mongrel, and a rugged individualist, for he wears no man's collar. As the tramp puts it, when you're footloose and collar free, you get nothing but the best. It's a new baby that brings these two together. For when the baby arrives, Aunt Sarah moves in, bag and baggage. The baggage being two Siamese cats with a talent for getting into mischief and getting Lady blamed for it. When Aunt Sarah slaps a muzzle on her, Lady becomes panic-stricken, bolts down the street with every stray in the neighborhood yapping at her heels. Luckily, our hero sees the lady in distress and comes to her rescue. The tramp talks a beaver into removing the muzzle and then takes Lady for a night on the town to show her a dog's life can be fun. There's dinner at Tony's, an old friend of the tramp's, a stroll through the park, and then, just for laughs, a little chicken chasing, which results in our Park Avenue debutante landing in the dog pound with an assortment of unsavory characters lady is brought home in disgrace. And now the villain enters. 
a rat who has always wanted to get into the house. Lady's helpless to stop him, and he enters the nursery window. The tramp, who is coming over to apologize, arrives just in time to rush in and take care of him. Aunt Sarah, of course, misunderstands, and accusing the tramp of attacking the baby, she sends for the dog catcher. But Jock and Trusty discover the truth and manage to intercept the wagon before it reaches the pound. So the tramp is saved, and as our story ends, we find our hero a reformed character, a family man complete with collar and license. The next phase of putting it on film takes us to the director's unit. It is the director's job to coordinate all phases in the making of the picture and follow it through from start to finish. This is Jerry Geronimi, one of the three directors on Lady and the Tramp. Tom Codrick, the art director and layout artist and Wooly Ritherman, one of the key animators. Jerry's assigning a scene to Wooly for animation, and they're discussing how it should go. Now, right here, Tramp's in a tight spot. These tough dogs have him down, and he's really outnumbered. Now, the problem is to get him out of this jam. What do you think? I feel the Tramp could have a light attitude towards this fight. He can handle twice this number. <laughs> what if he bit the big curl on the leg like this? Yeah. Starts down here at the bottom. And works his way right up the top. A real rapid fire action. <laughs> Swell. Now we get into free for all. Got the way out, Tom? Okay, now this has to be a real knockdown drag out battle. Make it exciting. We could get a good dramatic effect here by having part of the fight behind the barrels. And have shadows of the dogs cast on the wall. Okay, let's run through this scene with sound effects. The timing. Well, that's how a director plans a scene with an animator and layout artist. Now our dog actors have to be made to talk. Here are the voices of three important characters in Lady and the Tramp. Lady herself, Barbara Luddy. Jock the Little Scotty by Bill Thompson. Old Trusty the Bloodhound by Bill Bauckham. This particular scene is being directed by Ed Penner and Wilford Jackson. It didn't hurt, really. But Darling has never struck me before. Now, Lassie, do not take it too seriously. After all, at a time like this... Why, yes. You see, Miss Lady, there comes a time in the life of all humans when, uh... Well, as they put it, the birds and the bees. Well, uh, uh, well, uh, the star. What he's trying to say, Lassie, is Darling is expecting a wee bairn. Bairn? He means a baby, Miss Lady. Oh. What's a baby? That's good. Uh, say, Barbara. Yes? That line of yours, what's a baby? Just repeat it several different ways, will you please? All right. Okay, roll it. NW 2062, take two. What's a baby? What's a baby? What's a baby? What's a baby? This is Frank Thomas, one of our key animators. He's making the drawings that will animate part of the dialogue scene we have just heard recorded. He's not just making faces in the mirror for fun. He's mouthing the words as he hears them. Then he sketches the position of his mouth so that the character he's drawing will appear to be saying the words. Well, let's see what we've got here now. By flipping these drawings, at the same time we play the record on the playback machine, we get a pretty fair idea of what we're going to see on the screen. I'll show you. What's a baby? What's a baby? Now, here's Trusty, the old bloodhound. They're, they're mighty sweet. And here's Jock, the little Scotty. I'm very, very soft. Let's look in on Milt Call, another of our key animators. 
who's been teaming up with Frank Thomas on Lady and the Tramp right from the start of the picture. Right now, Milt is drawing the Tramp, who, of course, is our hero. He's going to show you how he and Frank developed the character of the Tramp. Well, first we thought of the Tramp with one black eye. Thought he'd be kind of cute. Sort of a tough little guy from across the tracks. But he didn't have a, oh, a certain debonair quality that we thought the character should have. Now, here's a good-looking fellow, but he takes life too seriously. No sense of humor. And here we have the sense of humor, all right, but he's too big and clumsy. Lady wouldn't want to go out with him. He didn't have to be a slicker, though, but we wanted a real good four-point he dog. Well, this is what we finally wound up with. Now, this is the first time we see the tramp in the picture. We pick him up down the railroad yards, sound asleep in a barrel. Then the train whistle wakes him up, and he yawns and stretches. <sighs> he goes over to the puddle of water, takes a drink, then he takes his morning shower. Ah, <sighs> what a day. Well, now to dig up some breakfast. Well, now suppose we see how boy meets girl, or dog meets dog in our story. It didn't hurt, really. But darling has never struck me before. When a baby moves in, the dog moves out. You have seen how we make the cartoons move and talk. Now, like all actors, they must have backgrounds to work in. These painted backgrounds are the equivalent of the sets used in live-action motion pictures. The background painter is guided by the layout, which shows the scene in detail. This is going to be the background for the scene where Tramp talks the beaver into removing Lady's muzzle. Now that the background is all painted, model cells are placed over it to check the complete setup. The thousands of drawings that have been animated go to the inking department to be transferred in ink to sheets of celluloid. From here they go to the painters who paint in the inked areas on the reverse side. And finally they go before the cameras where they are photographed in cinemascope and in color. Let's join Lady in the Tramp again. Lady has been muzzled by Aunt Sarah. Panic-stricken, she runs away and is chased by three mongrel dogs. Now this is where our hero, the Tramp, comes to her rescue. Part of our program is dedicated to Pluto, our first dog star. Hey, Pluto, you're on, boy. <laughs> Back in the early 30s, we were doing a story where Mickey Mouse escaped from a chain gang, and we needed a bloodhound. Pluto got the part and turned out so well we used him twice. Well, Pluto now had a permanent job in Mickey Mouse's little stock company. But his problems weren't entirely over. It happened that there was a certain actor named Donald Duck in the same company who was fond of practical jokes. Like a good trooper, Pluto went through some very rugged acting assignments, working hard and trying, but usually not succeeding in staying out of trouble. However, here's one story he thoroughly enjoyed, 
mainly because it gave him the chance to turn the tables on his friendly nemesis, Donald Duck. star <laughs> hey Pluto down <laughs> Pluto's star continued to rise in 1940 he was presented with the tailwaggers own Academy Award the Bosco for being the most promising dog actor of the year a supreme honor for achievement in dog circles his fellow artists in the human acting profession made it a grand slam when they awarded this same Bosco winning movie the Motion Picture Academy Award for the year my friend, will be rewarded in the earth, the end. But I believe Pluto's proudest moment really came during the war, when our fighting forces in every sector of the world began to shower in requests for Pluto to pose for their battle insignia. Here are just a few of the outfits who chose Pluto as their official mascot. Dear sir, our work consists of training dogs for attack and sentry duty for the Army. We thought a sketch of Pluto, fully trained and ready for action, would more than distinguish the dog training center. Dear Walt, our duty is very secretive here at the Naval Ordnance Lab, and we'd be happy if you could send us a sniffing Pluto for our insignia. Dear Mr. Disney, could you send us a fighting Pluto pouncing on a sub that we could trace on the funnel of our sub chaser? Dear sir, would like an insignia of Pluto with a devilish expression, holding a bomb, backed by a circle with the inscription, you're gonna get it. The crew of the submarine USS Dogfish has adopted Pluto as our mascot. We would like an insignia of Pluto with a diving helmet, a menacing grin, and a mermaid. Could you have Pluto imitate a patrol bomber diving on the enemy for Patrol Squadron 203? Yet through all these great moments, I think I can safely say Pluto hasn't changed a bit. He's still the same unaffected, simple-minded mutt he's always been. Even though his name appears high on the theater marquees along with the great picture stars of the day. See anything beat this canyon country? Yes, sir. Old Mother Nature has sure carved out some mighty pretty scenery. Just look at them rocks over yonder. The Indians tell me some of the daggonest legends about them you ever listened to. Oh, so cool, that little critter. Shucks. <laughs> that coyote won't hurt you. He's made of stone. So help me, folks, that's the story behind Coyote Rock. <laughs> 